Hello, my name is Richard Miller. You're at Never Not Here. Thanks for being here. And we're at a day after wrap up at a TAP Foundation retreat in West Virginia. And this is maybe the last meeting. Who knows? This is uh, a meeting that's in a, one of the historic buildings that uh, is part of the TAP Foundation. And so. Uh, we're talking to a few of these presenters and a few of the pillars of truth and transmission, the group, and uh, just to kind of make a wrap up on what happened this weekend. So please help me welcome Bob Ferguson. Hi, Bob. Hi, how are you doing, Richard? Great. Such an honor to be here and to know that... Uh, something so cohesive is happening for so many years and so many people care about each other themselves, you know, and maybe the whole world too, but, you know, they mm -hmm. definitely uh, express themselves toward, uh, toward each other. It's, yeah, it's been a wonderful group. I'd say it's the best group of people I've ever run into overall. You know, it's been in a lot of spiritual groups and different towns such as Boulder, Colorado, and done a lot of work with these groups over the years, and Tat's by far been the most sincere and, oh, most cohesive one I've ever been with. I think sincerity is a, a great keyword, and that uh, yeah. somehow it just means that let's go all the way, you know, let's go deeper at least, you know, until we, let's just see where our barrier is, you know, like when, when are we fed up, when have we had enough, when, when can't we stand each other anymore, you know, but let's go for it. It's, and it's been through a lot of hard times. We've been through Tat when Richard Rose was still around. We had, there was a cohesive group, and then after he was out of the picture, Tat dwindled down to just a few people, and it was a little hit or miss whether we were going to make it or not. And the core group of people stuck together. Things turned around quite a bit. So now we're back with, a, I think, a very dynamic group of teachers and students. When I was in AA after uh, having troubles with drinking years ago, I, one of the reasons I was so grateful to find a group like TAT was, for me, AA hit a point where, where can it go beyond not drinking? And what, what can you do once you've gotten to a spot where the drinking isn't the problem anymore? And Tat fulfilled that quite well and gave a format of integrity for people who were looking for something to go a little farther. And to take it, like you said, all the way to the end. Or as far as you can manage, as far yeah, as you're willing to as you, you bail out, right? As far as but you anyhow, can go. sobriety is just uh, putting you into functionality as far as... Uh, our regular hypnosis. Right? Yeah. It, it puts you, throws you right back in the hypnosis it, and say, it, you can be good at this again. <laughs> well, it gets you back on first base and gives you a clear head, you know, so yeah. you can make better decisions after that. You know, I had known uh, Richard Rose through the mail for years before I ever met him. And I first wrote him a letter, I think, in the early 80s. And his little response, which came back on hotel stationery he had saved from somewhere, it, it convinced me that this guy is sincere. I could pick that up from the letter. And after meeting the Tat guys, it was the same with everybody. That you had a group of people who were sincere about finding the truth and who you just immediately felt like this is, you know, a place where I can be safe to take this as far as I can get it. So even just with Richard Rose's handwritten words, you could pick up on that. I th Things where, you know, we were isolated. We thought maybe, okay, here's an enclave, here's a guy in West Virginia, here's a farm, you know. But now, the way uh, technology and connection have, have exploded, you guys are like a, a core that is worldwide, you know. You, you, read, you, you, have the re you can reach anywhere. This, this is true. It's changed quite a bit. When I first got into TAD, it was all handwritten letters. And when we tended to, after Rose was out of the picture and we tended to spread out all over the country, it wasn't a very good format until the internet came along. And then everything clicked. Tat got a website. 
we started online confrontation groups and got a web presence and this has been just incredible help in getting everybody together and keeping people in touch. It's a funny thing that the internet can actually be a way for uh, spiritual work to progress in a very real way. We know that a lot because yeah. we do Skype talks mm -hmm. and then we, we, can, we can feel them the same way we feel the presence in a room. Very, very similar, it is. We're constantly astounded by that. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a, good, it's a good tool. It's nothing like, I think, the, the dynamics that you can pick up from a meeting like we just had, where the, the presence of people can be felt a lot better. You know, some of the guys that have been in the TAC group, like I said, the best, the best people I've ever met, and falling into a, a rapport with them and being able to, to feel what these people are like, it gives you a sense of uh, possibility. You know that there is somewhere to go. This was something I picked up, uh, I think, from Richard Rose. One of the best things that he gave to me was just a sense that a white boy can do this. You don't have to go to India. You know, at the time I got into this work, everything was Tibet or India, Ramana Maharshi's Terra of Anomaly. And it came out to be that, oh, there, here is a hillbilly from West Virginia. And if he can make the trip, then, you know, so can I. And you could tell it from him. That's a great value. You know, mm -hmm. Because a lot of times our, um, the most precocious masters are so up on a pedestal, not by their own choice, but just the way we see it, you know. Mm -hmm. And we're just so separate from that and just say, well, I'm honored to be here. But you know, it never crosses our mind that that's us. Yeah, and it crosses your mind that, that, that a teacher of his caliber could be accessible, that you could sit in a room and have a cup of coffee with him and just bullshit about whatever's going on and still be able to to get the, the, the feel of the man's presence without having to go through layers of disciples or any of the other things. Mm -hmm. That you could just have an informal meeting with him, you know, the guard could be dropped. So now there's something totally different than now with that, okay, let's say, because it used to be that it was all focused on the point. Mm -hmm. But now there's something that there's a matrix. Okay, there's seven or eight of you guys or more, you know, and somehow I want to ask you about a synergy, like some the, the the whole is more than the sum of the parts, and like how you guys synergize, and what's what's the synergy? Ha and synergy means like each mm -hmm. one of your additions somehow yeah. is augmented by sure. the fact that uh, everyone's there rooting for you. Oh, sure, the you know the sum of the parts come out to be more than what they would add up to. You get a you know a dynamic going here with with. Uh, all the people we've got in the group now, it generates something. You know, it generates something that's beyond any of the individuals when they come together in this, this kind of group. And having that carry through year after year has been just invaluable. But it's even like uh, uh, season after season, right? Mm -hmm. You have to do it four times? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh -huh. We go through this four times a year. The meetings have a different format. We get through these things, different opportunities for different kinds of people. The April meeting's more of a talking head show where people can get up and explain themselves to people. And then we have a September meeting, which is more workshops. Gives you a different feel for it. Is there still uh, uh, multiple teachers in, with more workshops, or what do you mean? How does it work? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's, you rotate through, I think, was it four different ones? And on one weekend? Mm -hmm, on one on weekend, week yeah, weekend, yeah, two in, two in one day and then rotate back through the next two the next. So you get to have one-on-one -on -one classes with four different teachers over the weekend. And it's it's going to be a, a real helpful system to get your head shaken up quite a bit. I, I, <laughs> no, it's really cool, and it's like something new. Like it's some, and you know, I didn't know what kind of concept I, uh, it was, or like I didn't know how to take it, you know, because I thought, okay, well, it's nice to be meeting a lot of people, but uh, uh, is 90 minutes enough with one person? Mm -hmm. And thinking that, like, I'm used to weekend retreats where you have the whole retreat with one person. Yeah, and, and just but, in a regular TAT meeting, this can happen because, you know, the people aren't locked away. You can walk up and talk to anybody anytime they've got time. It's not like anybody's got a thing about coming out, giving a talk, and disappearing again. Right on. No, that's mm -hmm. totally true. 
And I mean, so much work is done uh, at the at the lunch table or at uh, just um, but in breaks, and and even in the sangha, you call it the sangha. But I mean, even among uh, people that are attending, there's great talks going on. There is, and there's there's a great fellowship, but there's also a great. I think one of the most important factors about these meetings is the tension that can build up. This was something when I first got into the group that I didn't know quite how to handle it. The group had a lot of tension, a lot of energy flowing around. I think this uh, is part of uh, being around people who may have a little bit less what you might call ego in them, and the ego in you can get kind of nervous about this. It took me a while to get used to it. I used to have to go outside out into the grass and take a breath and then come back in to be able to handle the height of tension. Some of the other groups I've been in over the years, as soon as that tension would develop in the group, people would leave. And I think the, what might set Tat apart is, is the tension is there, but there's also something to keep you in the, into the group. and It doesn't drive you out. Let's talk around that tension tension, you know, that high voltage, or let's talk around that a little bit and try to really grasp how the, what's the mechanism or how it works or where does it attack or where do you feel? Is it a feeling? Or yeah, a, it's a, a feeling of just there's a certain form of tension or energy in the room that isn't, it, it's in a sense, it's not a relaxing form of energy. It's a form of energy that causes you to, to maybe question things about yourself as it brings them up into the light. You know, the, the questions that you might get in the TAT meeting also have a charge behind them rather than just being, you know, theoretical things that can hit you right right here. You know, I wouldn't doubt that there's been people several times over the years that have been getting hit with the tension to the point where it can break through the defenses and get to a certain spot in your heart and just uh, release things, things that might be blocks in your path. And that tension is usually directed right towards what you might call the more false elements in yourself. If you've got any of the ego systems that you might develop socially that you want, aren't really aware of, and you come into that tension in the room, it causes a, a paradox, a juxtaposition. It, it can cause a, that tension to, to lead to a questioning. You know, why do I feel like this around these guys? What, what is that tension? I've heard it described... Uh, with Rose in many different ways, he had that tension personally in him. He had it to an extent that you don't see in too many of the TAT guys. It's, it's that strong, but it's the same quality. So that's very rare, you know. Why do I feel this way? Yeah, Usually right. we just mm -hmm. take off and say, this is the shit's yeah. here. I'm uh -huh. out of here. Yeah. I, I've been we a, don't, uh, what is it that allows us to say, well, why do I feel this way? Mm -hmm. well, yeah. That, you know, I mean, I guess there's a, lo a lot of people looking for the root. You know, mm -hmm. looking at the root or uncovering what's under the carpet here. And yeah. so then that uh, maybe, is that just something that uh, rubs off on people? And they're saying, well, I'll take a look too. Or, or just by the fact that somebody has seen it and has an aha and maybe expresses that in some way. And then we, and then we realize, oh, that could, that's a model. That, that could, I could see something about myself maybe. Well, it's a model and it also can provoke a certain form of curiosity. And when I met Rose and found that, that tension in him, I had never seen that in a man before, and I didn't know what that meant. You know, why has this guy got what you might call power in him? It's a different feeling than I'd ever felt before. It, he wasn't trying to, uh, oh, to, you could tell that his head wasn't going to bow down to other beliefs. The guy knew what he was, and that, that wasn't a problem with him. And in the TAT group, it's, it's almost like a, there's a certain form of underlying uh, truth to the matter that you can pick up on. There's a certain form of uh, of integrity in it. And this can cause tension if you've never run into it. Some of the groups uh, I've been in in uh, Boulder and such, anytime this would manifest itself, the people would get nervous and run. I think the reason people don't run in the TAT group is is it's it's they're drawn in because of the the folks' personalities and the quality of their life. And you can see that, oh, well, if that guy's got that, you know, what is it? I want it. And I want to find out what, what this guy's got. I can sense it, and I'm going to hang around long enough to figure out what it is. Well, we all run because of the sense of safety. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, safety of what? Uh, Sense of safety. Well, you know, it can be a false safety, but it, it's mm-hmm. there. It's a feeling that, you know, and it, and it well, it, it generates a feeling, you know, and then we say, well, <clears throat> it's not safe here. You know, it could be just our false self is not safe. But anyhow, there's some kind of a, a boundary that gets crossed, and then mm-hmm. that, and that generates a, and, you know, every person has it where they have it. You know, we don't know where, exactly where that that cuts in or cuts out or, not, or well, how many times we can cross it or how much closer we can get to it. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, uh, and then sooner or later, if people feel unsafe, they're going to blast off. Right. Yeah. Well, you've got, you know, safety is a, is a, a funny thing. You know, you can talk about safety of the ego or you can talk about, you know, safety of the body, but these, these things, uh, sooner or later have to be dropped if you're going to look for something a little deeper. You know? And this, the safety might be that, you know, Without a doubt, that these folks don't have uh, any kind of other agenda. They're going to want to be motive, truth so. to you. Yeah, uh-huh. they're not not after your pocketbook. So you can you can tell that something's going on. There's a certain spirit about it. Well, it could, it could be a respect. Mm-hmm. Something about the atmosphere is safe, mm-hmm. and something about it feels unsafe. Maybe because, like you were saying, there's a tension, right? Mm-hmm. And so that's the part that feels unsafe. But something about the way you are together and among and openness. And accepting and embracing other people is a safe is somehow there's something safe about it. So that must allow people to drop their defenses uh, to another degree, and and maybe it's uh, very rare in the world. It's very rare in the world if you want to face something that you can be honest enough about yourself to know that it's the unknown. If you want to come into some part of yourself that you don't know about, you want to look for the truth. Say, you know what? You don't know what that is. So you're going to, if you're going to be honest with yourself, that's an unknown. Now, how are you going to have any kind of clue of what direction or what that feels like, or trust the people around you who are going to take you into that? You know, who are you going to use for a guide to head off into the darkness? You know, so you know what? What are these people like? Well, one of the first things you want to look for is, you know, can I find people who can show me a little bit about this that I can trust? Am I going to go to the weekend with them? And are they going to have two things? Can I trust their ability to guide me and can I trust their ability of having an actual knowledge of where they're going and you can pick up on both of these things in a tap meeting that's cool part about having multiple people because you know you can't you think one of them might be rotten or try to have motives but all of them probably don't right I mean somehow they like each other well (laughs) and and plus you got an ability you might be more of an intuitive type and you know the reasoning you know, teachers might not make any sense to you. You know, you can pick up that this guy's intuitive and you've got several different people around and you might can find the one that clicks with your head. You know, if, if you can't feel, have the feeling of an intuitive type, the reasoning person might be the one to go with. And there's very distinct different people in TAT weekends who have these different fields. So also, we had, a, I think, a record number of women come into this one. There were, tw- I think, 22 women at the TAT meeting this time which is just phenomenal. So, you know, they're picking up on something too here. So then there's more than just the Richard Rose mold. In other oh, words, yeah. you're saying there's the intuitives here too. Yeah, there are intuitives, intuitives here for sure. And, you know, Richard Rose is, is the rock on which all this was built, but it, it, it's still carrying on. And it, it's diversified out into a wide audience. You know, there, there's a lot better feel to some of the things that are going on now than for a general audience than there might have been when we were first starting out. You know, it's become, I don't know, more widespread. I think a better message that is being carried out through the internet and stuff. Do most people like you have your own individual website or is this Oh yes, all? I've got... Yeah. Well, several of them, actually. I've got a one that's been around for 10 years or more called the Mystic Missile, where I put out also a newsletter. I used to take a teacher or a group and then do a newsletter on the giving information and my personal take on that teacher or that group. I've set them up on archives so that people can always find references to these people on there so they can look through take a look at what my take is on all these different teachers and books. I've also got my own personal website for what I found, which is called the Listening Attention Site, where I've got most of my writing up. I've also been working for several years on trying to convey things through photography that 
I didn't think I could convey through words. I put this up on a site, a site called Nostalgia West. And this is something I've been working with with uh, Sean Nevins for a while in order to try to show what you might call uh, the standing now. A fellow back in Roman times called Boethius, who was a spiritual teacher, said that the standing now shows you eternity. The moving now is time. If you can catch a glimpse through, through photography of what he's talking about with the standing now, then the only way a person can see that is through the eternal part of himself. So if you get a picture that can somehow relate this and put it out there to a person with the message that, hey, you know, your proper frame of mind in this photograph can lead you into an eternal part of yourself. If you can look at this photograph like that with the, the book that Sean and I have, with also some of his poetry, I think it can put a very good uh, mood of understanding on how eternality is actually present in every person. It's not a, it's not a buildup of more and more time. It's a state that's always here. And the standing now, in a certain sense, is a, a better way to approach it in a certain sense than saying eternity. And give people an idea, a little bit more of a way to get out of their head and to look at the pictures with a more open mind about preconceived conceptions and put them into that silent, non-moving part in themselves. This is, it's been a, something that's been very hard for me technically. When I go out with the camera, I can see these things quite easily in a certain sense, but to get that back onto a picture is just, you know, one in a million type thing. But when it hits, it hits, and I think it's, it's one of these days I'd like to have it down to where I have at least a few examples I could bring, say, to TAT meetings that could run through a slideshow and show people exactly what I'm talking about with this without having to use uh, any other verbiage other than maybe poetry. Bob, you're blowing my mind. <laughs> I haven't heard of the standing now. <laughs> and, uh, of course, I do video, so mine now is moving yeah, frame, here's 30 a... frames a second, you know, and you're doing a freeze frame, and somehow yeah. I don't get it, you know. I mean, uh, so then you're saying that some, some photos of the West, uh, it, it could be freeze any freeze frame that uh, Yeah, it could be any, you. any photo that, that, that just has that certain mood to it that, that causes... Uh, the mind to perhaps go into a more of a nostalgic mood without too much movement. And then if the proper uh, incentive was there, and the person was looking at it for the express purpose of finding something out spiritual from looking at these pictures, then they could take a look at it and perhaps that would convey something to them. It could be uh, pre-verbal. I used to see this before I got into photography when I would walk around suburbs at night in the dark or maybe with a full moon and be able to see certain forms of architecture and houses and to me these showed just uh, moments of perfection which could, you could call the standing now too is it is a shot of uh, a place that we might have come from uh, in essence that we've forgotten about here and these moments of the standing now remind us of that it shows us that we have an eternality inside each one of us that we've forgotten about that could be connected through by what you might call a trick with photography. You know, Boethius' quote, which is, you know, the, <clears throat> the moving now is time, the standing now shows us eternity. I know this, this fellow knew this a thousand years ago before there was photography. So the moving now is kind of like our hypnotism. Yeah, it is. It's, it's the movement... And it also, if there's movement in the mind, then the movement you might say there is, is of time and space. If you can stop the mind's movement and allow something to slip through, then the more eternal part of yourself that you can wake up just for a little bit, give you a little bit of a hint as to what something greater than time, space, and associations are. These glimpses of uh, so it's unexpected, probably. Yeah, it, it, it's, so it's a surprise because I even heard is. some people uh, this weekend say, "Well, you know, okay, I did these meditations, I did these techniques, I did this process, I did this seeking, 
But then something took me by surprise. Mm -hmm. And you, so what took him by surprise was the standing now. Right? Well, the standing now, or the, the, the eternal part of themselves could find a way to slip through the moving mind or the egoic mind. And the egoic mind is all the expected mind. You expected know? It's all mind. going as expected, you know. Yeah. The concepts are holding up, you know. They're, they're, exactly. They're, they're, the story. they're without a chink in, them, in the yeah. armor, right? Yeah, you've got the storyline going along the way you always well, thought it always would. Wanted it. And there's nothing can slip through the cracks. You can't find anything that's not going to be associated with what was what had come before so of course there's nothing expected you're moving from the past to the future but you're skipping so skipping like the your, middle kind of like your uh, the hypnotism is validated yeah it is it was validated in force and plus well, one good thing about something like a tat meeting which gets back to that tension could be that if you're in something like a tat meeting then there are people present who have this eternality active in them so you could say that there's a part of this person who is his essential part, which is the standing now. Being in their presence could greatly facilitate the possibility that might happen to you. It's active in them, so that mm -hmm. means that part of their attention is on that. Yes, and it can be recognized by the part that's in you. We can't find something if it's if it wasn't in us. It's under the haystack. Right? Oh, yeah, well. it, it has to. It finds that which relates to itself. Say if we, if you're out watching a beautiful sunset which might could, you know, get you a glimpse of the standing now if, if the mood was right. If you find this beautiful sunset and you see the beauty in it, if you're lucky enough to take a look back into yourself at the same moment, you'll see that this beauty is actually coming from you and being projected onto the sunset. The sunset is a uh, like enough slate or picture out there that will accept the projection. Well, in a way, we're... Uh, um... We're letting go of the moving now. Right? Yeah, we're letting go of the moving now. We can, because we can the sunsets jogged us out of it. Jogged us out of it, and we also get, are used to saying, oh, you contemplate a sunset, so we get a little bit of something that can help us to find that mood. Of course, something like a sunset isn't threatening, but you can look at it and see the beauty and realize that that beauty isn't in the sunset, that beauty is in you. The same thing with the standing now. The, the pictures I might show somebody don't have the standing now in a bunch of uh, ink on a piece of paper, but it gives you a, a, a slate upon which to project that part that's in you. It can be a safe way, too. You might not want to look at the eternality in yourself because, you know, what the heck does that mean? But if you can see it in a picture at first, it could get you a little bit more familiar with it. To be away for the ego. Yeah, maybe what the heck does that mean? You said, you know, like you yeah. don't even recognize it for seeing it, you know, mm -hmm. You're face to face and, 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 uh, and uh, it just doesn't show up on yeah, the radar, right? Exactly. Because somehow it's so far outside of. The, there's no expectation that can to contain it. Yeah, there's no expectation to contain it, and we don't have anything to relate it to. If you, somebody tells you, "Well, you know, you have an eternal essence," well, you know, what, what's that going to mean? Those are those yeah, are just nice. those are just words. But if somebody can show you, "Hey, well, if we can get in a certain mood, take a walk on a moonlit night, and look at an old library," or if I can show you a slide with a uh, friend's poetry with it, and then all of a sudden your head stops because of the, the uh, eternality in you is able to project itself out, then you've got a little bit of an inroad. There's a little bit of a connection there, which might can be widened out. So you might can find a little bit more of that eternality in there through that certain way. The ego doesn't like to see these things directly. It threatens the heck out of it. Right, right. I don't know. Sounds like you're a dynamite photographer, you know, because you're saying that these photos stop you in your tracks. <laughs> well, the, the, the dynamite Bonks. photographer stuff stops usually in my head, and then once I get into the camera, then that's where the trouble starts. You know, learning the technique of this is, you know, an ongoing thing. You know, working in, in Photoshop and trying to get the, the out into the woods at the right magic moments to take these pictures is, is a lot of work, and then trying to get them to where they pop up on a website and might actually, you know, do something for somebody. It, it's an ongoing process. I know that it, it's possible. You know, Sean and I put a little book out with examples of this, with poetry we picked out from, from him, and with the pictures that relate to the poetry, we're hoping to be able to, to put that mood up. As somebody browses through the book, maybe this will start to have an effect on them to calm down that mind. And then I can see something that, you know, two members of TAT 
have gotten together in two slightly different forms of art to try and convey that sense of you do have an eternal essence. You didn't come from this. This mess isn't, you know, what we're a part of. There is a little bit of a, a longing that might be can remembered that comes from perfection. Now that, that perfection that's inside can all of a sudden maybe wake up and go, hey, you know, I, I, I'm still in here, you know, I don't have to sleep through this mess out here and give you just a little moment to connect with. You know, maybe from that, talking to the other members in TAT about things, it, it, they say what Tess Hughes was talking about last night with her experiences with, with the jewelry box, climbing up the mountains, these kinds of things can give you that same feel. Then you, you start to pull a thread together. It's like putting little beads on a string. You know, you've got a little memory. Well, if I saw that sunset, if I saw this certain picture, I heard that person talk. You know, the, these little moments of eternality maybe can line up in to be a big enough force inside yourself to promote a little action. You know, in a different direction than maybe the ego and the verbiage might take you. Right, a lot of times we concentrate on the verbiage. Mm -hmm. Saying like, even maybe I was thinking of a question like that, you know, I mean, this kind of is new in the mix to say that there's, you know, some graphics, some poetry, some, uh, you know, it's a, poetry in a way is like something that's outside of the, of the moving, you know, normal moving field, the normal expectation. Somehow there's a, it's a haiku a, or a, uh, you know. So. It is. It's a very good way for an intuitive feeling type to come into this work to feel that there is something they can, they can get started with other than, than the words. You, I've always felt that there's, has to be, well, there is a, has to be a point where thinking stops and the work has to go below that. It has to become something that is a task of the attention rather than of the moving mind. And how do you know what that attention is or what direction you should be putting it into? I think with the uh, poetry and the photographs, you, if you're watching yourself through practice with observing meditations and you see what kind of effect happens if you do have a moment of seeing the standing now, then it could be an enormous clue to show you what the direction, say, of going within is. You know, words like going within were meaningless to me. You know, from a verbiage point of view, you know, what, what does that mean? It, it seems to lead you into just more and more circles of the mind. But having a... Yeah, right. And every day yeah. it's just a... It, spir it spirals in a way, like, I mean, it's another circle, but still it doesn't have any meaning. Yeah, it doesn't have any meaning, but a, a moment of... Uh, of a photograph or a poem that can show that to you, Mike can give you a little hint that, wow, there's something I can get to that can be done in a, in a, rather than just juggling more and more words. And one thing that's wonderful about Tad is, is I've gotten an incredible encouragement and outlet or possibility for the photography that I wouldn't have had anywhere else. Sean's been a, a wonderful help with, you know, using his little, uh, special style in order to prod me to keep taking it further and further. And on a home like the TAT group is a wonderful way to be able to find what works for you in it. There's no doctrine in here that says, oh, we have to sit around and read Richard Rose's words. Rose would say, you know, don't believe me, find out for yourself. So this gives you the freedom to say, what if it is photography or poetry and that I'm not going to have to you know, sit in a chair drinking herbal tea with a smile on my face, you know, I, I can go out and actually engage in something I like. Uh, this is, you know, it's more than I even was thinking of, you know, it's like, uh, it's amazing because uh, any one of these things alone, standing alone, would ha be deficient. Mm -hmm. And somehow putting them all together, uh, each one supports the other and each one kind of like knocks that, uh, that, 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 automatic motion down another notch and, and makes a little a bigger chink that yeah it, 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 it knocks another another brick out of the wall you've got a little bit more light coming within you know a little bit more direction or encouragement in a certain way that isn't uh you know too much related to the, the talking mind you might say you know it, there's different ways to to get approach this and i think that we we get very one-sided. When I first got into the group, all I had was an intuitive feeling way to work at it. 
working around other people such as Sean and Art, which were opposite in their personality to me in a certain way, taught me that, you know, there's a way that I need to be able to get about this in a reasonable way. I started out in, in the group uh, liking poetry and being one of the few things that I could read. Rose's books to me seemed very dry when I first got into them. But I realized that there's got to be a better way for me to look at this, so I started trying to write essays and became, you know, to, to the point where I've written dozens and dozens of the things. I've got a little book out of them now, but it, when I first started doing this, it was such incredibly hard work. But it pulled another side of myself in to try and use in the work to counteract the uh, being too lopsided with the intuitive feel. And Sean, I think, was the other way around. He was very, you know, being able to write prose and things and finally got into Rumi. I remember when I first was trying to get him to read Rumi poems, he just laughed. He thought they were silly. You know? And now the guy is a, a Rumi poet in his own right. You know? No, amazing. <laughs> just to hear that, you know, hear you say that, it blows me away because I think that, oh my God, I just thought he was so... So intuitive. Well, with the with the tat group too, you you have a, something to be able to to flower out in this respect. You know, the photography to me was great from the intuitive standpoint, but how do I do that? I mean, being a videographer yourself, you know what all the work, technical work's involved. You can't just be intuitive and think this stuff's gonna yeah, do by itself. itself right? Yeah, you know, who who's gonna work Photoshop for hours on end and get these things out to where another person can look at them? You know, I had to get the reasoning parts of myself in somewhat order in order to be able to work, you know, a computer and get these things out onto the Internet. And, and that's another great thing about TAT is you've got a forum that you can, you can pull these uh, little techniques of uh, trying to show somebody something out of the mundane that you've got a forum to actualize this in. There's a spot for anybody that wants to come in here who wants to work on those things in any kind of real way, he's got people to work with. It's kind of like a test market. Yeah. It, a and company it, that has a test market can really go, you know, can really develop uh, something new. But those people that only can move out to the masses, the one market, mm -hmm. uh, it never happens. It just doesn't really get modified and, and built. To, uh, well, and exactly. And plus it helps that, that person to carry things on. I mean, to, to have the... Uh, ability to communicate with another through whatever means that you have, you, you need practice at it and a place where there's people around who will listen to what you've got to say and tap, you know, provides that in a way that where you know the people are uh, able to provide good and true feedback to you. You know, you know that they know what the uh, go end goal is. You know, if you come in with, with a person who he wants to put something out that he's seen about uh, oh, eternity or his internal self, then he knows the TAT group. People in there are familiar with this. So he, he can, they can tell him, you know, good feedback where the general public might, you know, might be just a gimmick. That's an immense fertility. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is. It immense is. Uh, possibility for growth and for innovation and for uh, renewal and for... It, and it, it gives you a, a constant uh, source of irritation in a certain sense because... Oh, you yeah, know, that's you, that tension you're talking <laughs> about, right? It's yeah, yeah you. you get the tension, you know, hey, well, if I'm going to actually start doing this, then I might better get a little bit uh, more on the spot with it, you know. I, I don't want to drop the ball on this because, you know, this could actually lead to something. You know, it gives, it gives other people in the TAT group a great opportunity to step forward in a certain sense. If, they're asked or given the opportunity to give a talk for the first time, then they, they're able to move up quite a, quite a step by having that tension put on them. You know, I've got a safe place I can give this talk right. to, but I'd better actually get on the stick and actually right. get this thing ready. Forum. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh -huh. really great. You know, I was going to ask a question like you're answering it left and right before I even ask it. You know, I was going to say, like, even presenters know that mm -hmm, mm -hmm, people come to listen to them and and many walk away confused or, or with a misapprehension. And yet, these words are the ones that came out, and so then you just kind of say, well, trust that they'll work with it. or yeah. you know, But you know dang well that they're still tight with whatever they're... And they really didn't... 
Like, I mean, even you and me will talk together and we're not going to totally absorb what each of, each of us say and say, oh yeah, that was, I'll incorporate that, rate that into my life, you know. And so then it doesn't really, so much of what we, we attempt doesn't transmit. Mm-hmm. If you get, uh, if you find that at one point down the road you have something to say and you want to figure out how you're going to communicate this, this to other people, and something like this is, is a wonderful thing because you have other people who the communication can flow to and, and give you an idea of how that might work properly. Like I, I could never have figured out how do I make a photograph of the standing now and be successful with it and test it out on my, say, people I work with or my family. You know, they, they might be polite to me and tell me, oh, yes, that's beautiful, that's wonderful, but I, I don't see that it's hit its mark. But coming into the TAT group, then you know that whatever your uh, intended target is, is real. It's, it's as if you have a, a vacuum or a, a need or a longing in yourself, and it is fulfilled by that answer, which perfectly fits the form of the longing. If you get this with the same way with putting out the pictures, it can show the standing now. It can come forth to the people who have that in themselves, which has been awakened and realized, and then you can see that, well, it works. So I've hit this on the right target. I don't know. There's something even deeper than that. I used to work Photoshop and uh, uh, Quark, as I guess what I was, you know, some kind of a page maker. And I was doing advertising, and uh, I was... I would look at, I would create these ads and I think they're perfect. They're so mm-hmm. readable and they're so, you know, and one thing feeds the other and these, and it's broken into sections. So ideas are broke up mm-hmm. and so on and so on. And then I would think it's just perfect, perfect, perfect after a long work with it. And then I'd get someone to just come over and look at it and they didn't have to give an ounce of feedback. Just the fact that they were standing there over my shoulder and I would look at it and somehow I was able to transform myself into their eyes. And I was saying, this is the most confusing bunch of garbled, this is terrible. Just mm. by having them stand there, you know, then I just realized, oh my God, I can take this back to the, to the drawing board. This is, oh no, they're not getting this, you know, and they just look, maybe look at them in their face and they're going, uh. yeah. <laughs> I, I think and Tat's doing a really good, good job too with a certain sense with our message we're putting out in a way. Say if Sean's poetry or my photographs go out there and somebody sees these and comes to a Tat meeting, they're going to get the real thing. You know, what, what they might have picked up on the website, they're going to find that when they come to TAT is the same thing. I think there's a certain feeling about TAT, a certain presence that kept me coming back because I would find, a, oh, a, I don't know, a sense of silence and a sense of, of a inner peace that I had hardly ever felt before in a TAT meeting. And it would stick with me for days and days after I got back home. And then it would slowly die out in the world. And I thought, there, you know, I've got to keep going back. I've got to find out what the heck is that? How can I keep that once What's I've that come mechanism? back? What is that mechanism? Mm-hmm. What triggers it and what yeah. kind of diminishes it? How can I get that? How does that work? Yeah, and what, what do these guys have that, you know, that I feel... Uh, you know, this inner need for, this is what I've been looking for in a certain way. You know, this is, this is the answer of, uh, of answers that, that is indescribable, that comes through in, in a TAT meeting and can stick with a person that has enough, you know, presence to hit something inside of them to, you know, stick with them for a little bit. Cause people, I know like myself, to want to say, I've got to go back, you know, I've got to go back and find this and find out how can I get that you know, in myself, so that it, the, the workday world doesn't take it away from me anymore. One way that, that I found that helped that was to try and get into, oh, how can I help out in the group? You know, what, what can I do? What, what, what would be a niche that gets me a little bit closer in on, on this feeling? So actually, instead of just uh, concentrating on taking energy out of the group, yeah, just concentrate yeah. on putting how, energy yeah, in it, how can, know, yeah. being in the flow of it. Yeah, and then, and then how can I get that to be uh, a permanent link in myself, so to speak, rather than just something I'm going, you know, like you're saying, picking it up from the meeting, you know, spend my three days there and get my buzz and come home again, you know. Try to put it into a refrigerator or something yeah, so uh-huh. it'll keep it stay in a, fresh, right? <laughs> yeah, keep it in a can, you know. 
But it, oh, there, there's so many different things you can talk about from this angle. I think the just the the confidence and the the sharing part of it, you know, and getting into any kind of uh, artwork for me, though, the primary thing that I've picked up on it from Tat is that it's it's a way of transmission. It's a way to show people out there something that you have in the scene that you can hold up a little roadmap for them and say, you know, maybe you can get a glimpse out of this. You can get a glimpse out of this that will lead you back to something in yourself. And then maybe they don't particularly want to go down a spiritual path in the same direction, but they know something's out there. They know if they take one more step along their path, perhaps by you providing a little clue with them, they can find a way to do it one more step on their own. I think Tat's been just wonderful about that, helping people to get one more move. They might not necessarily have to come back to the Tat meeting. Just one at a time, right? Yeah. But they, no, I see it's immensely valuable. You know, here's what's coming to me is like, in a way, we want we want our own power. We want our own, you know, and we don't necessarily mm-hmm. want to adopt some kind of somebody's method or something like that and say, well, that method is... I have to rely on that. That's going to be my permanent crutch or that's, you know, I'm going to be a meditator or, mm-hmm. or whatever this guy's technique is or so on, or this guy or the back bhakti part, the devotion part yeah. toward a certain person like that. So then, okay, here, let's say we have seven or eight people that uh, maybe they all have some kind of a system, right? Mm-hmm. But we know, but uh, each one of those systems is, is a work of, is a work of art in itself, but, but none of them are definitive. Mm-hmm. Because all those systems are working for a certain group of people, this one works, and then this one works, and that one works. So when the and the effect I get out of that is that it's a real safe place to come because you're not going to get married to any kind of a system. There's all these systems you can see, and you can see that in the end, it's all right here. It throws it back right on on on, on me, and so then it feels like it's very empowering. You know, it empowers the me, and it doesn't mm-hmm. transfer my. I'm not dependent. It doesn't make me dependent on, on a guru or a technique or uh, or even uh, a group of people, you know? Yeah, there was one thing I noticed, too, when uh, working, when I first got onto the farm with Richard Rose, too, and Tat, was that it's not necessarily all about an all for nothing we're going for the for the end road. I mean, that's the final goal, the reason most people get into it. But Rose and the people in Tat have also been incredibly helpful just to getting people, you know, to make another step in life. You know, Rose had no problem with trying to help somebody quit smoking cigarettes or stop drinking to uh, get themselves a little bit better life. So anything you can do in any of these formats to, to help somebody out. You know, if I, through doing this work, can even get anybody just a little bit better along the line of anything in day-to-day life. You know, you can't stop it just at the, uh, oh, we're going for the goal or nothing else. You don't know how that's going to work out. You know, just for me to be able to get to the point where I had any kind of confidence in artwork and trying to do photography was just a wonderful thing. You know, much less I totally to love that. You know, that's what I call where the rubber hits the road, the point mm-hmm. of traction. You yeah. know, like that, why doesn't this, these teachings of freedom show up in life? Mm-hmm. You know, and we're supposed to say, keep saying, well, we're not doing this for a result or, you know, it's not that the result is too mundane and we're just going for the goal. But I just totally agree with what you're saying is that uh, uh, this teaching show, freedom shows up in life and, and, uh, and it should... We should tra- one guy says travel lighter, yeah. travel easy. Some of you should come of it, and then you could it, come of it. So I say uh, should, but I mean, I'm, uh, and there's a wonderful thing too you can pick up in tattoo is how you can further your path is through helping somebody else further theirs. We might have different paths that we're on. I've been lucky enough to have had a lot of time to do different things like photography and spend a lot of time sitting in the desert or whatever. But I haven't just done it just out of a hedonistic viewpoint. You know, there's always the goal that whatever I've picked up out there, whatever I've thought about, I can write it down, get it in the form of a picture, and take it back and try and put it out there where somebody else, just by some clue or chance or whatever, might stumble upon it. That might be the little uh, foothold that they need to get them back started on something. This happened to me with Richard Rose. I, the reason I got into the group was just 
almost purely by accident, I saw a little ad in the Rocky Mountain News for a talk he was giving. It was in a Denver newspaper. And I didn't read the paper regularly. I just happened to pick one up. I saw this little ad. I was struck by the picture of him. I knew right away from the picture that, you know, hey, you know, this guy's on the level. So I wrote his address down. I couldn't make the talk. And then I wrote him a letter. And he wrote right back. <laughs> I didn't hear back from his secretary. I heard back from the guy in person. You know, and I think a lot of that's still true with the guys in TAT. You know, they're, they're willing to go they're out of available. their way to talk to people and available. They know that any of these little clues that, that might we might can put out there to people, if they want to answer that, follow that thread back up, you know, then provide them with, with another step. Provide them with a connection. You know, and, you know, answer their emails, you know, if they want to take a look at the pictures and comment on them. And, you know, maybe try to explain a little bit more about what I had in mind, you know, with the pictures. You know, you ain't trying to get any of these things or, or truth or beauty that you might see and you can put out there. It's good to have a connection back to something that the person can follow up on. And say, hey, you know, how, how did you do that? What, what was your incentive for that? You know, I just like, or even just like to thank you about it. You know, maybe that sets up a little connection there. And if I could ever get just to the point of getting. You know, a half dozen good photographs uh, that I thought could convey anything about uh, a person's inner essence through through that standing now. We could get these into some sort of format where I could get to a decent audience with them. I think that would be, you know, having work, gone through all the work of sitting through hours and hours of Photoshop. You know, you get, a, you know, one person to a TAT meeting. I think I'd be more than worthwhile. Maybe this video will get one person to a TED meeting. I don't know. That's you know, my photo, know. my Photoshop, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, and get something going through you, through your way of you know communicating. You know, ha having any kind of link that can put the, I don't know, any kind of message that that has what I'm talking about, about TAT, you know, the, the integrity of the people there, the, the group of people, what they've tried to carry on and keep alive. You know, the world is a, is a messy, nasty place, you know, and having any kind of group of people with some link out of it, you know, there, there's your escape tunnel, you know, you know out of the, the, the nuttiness of the moving mind back into the eternal part of yourself, you know, if a door opens up, you know, what a wonderful opportunity. You, know, you need to jump with both feet. So in a way, we're putting out a story, you know, like certainly I am. A conversation is a story, or we're building mm -hmm. images, and you have images that you build, and, and these images jog, jog our story, or jog people's stories. Or, and I guess most of us are thinking that there's a better story, and that we should have, you know, we should get uh, to a better place to have a deeper understanding, and that story is going to take us somewhere. And really, we're not saying that at all, at all, you know, we're just kind of poking at the story and trying to turn it over and look under it and look over it and say, well, is this, is this real? Is this something that uh, I need to depend on? Is this mm -hmm. something that uh, I'm limited by? And then uh, that's what we're finding out is that, no, I'm not limited by that story. Yeah, you're not limited by the story and the moving mind is such a, a hypnotic thing that we, we forget that there's a that in a certain sense, we didn't come from here, and we're not of here. The part that's of here and that was made here is the least reliable um, part of ourselves. You know? and, and for some kind of strange reason, we've become to value that. This can be called a, you know, a question of values. If, if you can find a, a moment of the standing now, and somehow or another something in you puts that value onto it, above and beyond what the moving mind has, then that can be a big clue to maybe find out, is there something more in me? Will, will I pay attention to it if it pops up? And can I put meaning onto an eternality rather than simply thoughts? Yeah.
I like that term standing now. I mean, it's something that we can just use uh, in all forms of teaching, not only in photo photography or graphics or poetry. It's something that we can uh, um, just say that that's what really we're looking for in all our verbiage and in all our explanations and in all, all yeah. our practices and in all our uh, opening or sinking to the heart and everything. We're just seeing that the the depth. It's the, the foundation that it, of everything that's going on. It, it's the, the gap between the thoughts, the, the frame behind the photograph. You know, everything is dependent on it. Well, without that that eternality of the standing now, then there, there's nothing for the mind to build onto, nothing to show the movie on. You know, it, it, we've just taken a step outside of ourselves in, into the movie, into the photograph, rather than keeping back in the internal part of ourselves, which is still. Uh, the silence, the stillness are the, the parts where, that have the value, they have the meaning. For some reason or other, we become hypnotized by the movement which moves us along in associations in the mind, and somehow or other we can't stop that. And if we can get back to the part inside our mind which does not have associations, which has still intelligence, and the part of ourselves which uh, does not have movement, which has eternality and substance, you know, th this is a tremendous step back. Tremendous, you know, retreat back out of the, the, the garbage that we find out in, out in the moving mind, and go back into something that's more eternal, that has meaning, and which is going to uh, be there when the movie show is long over with. Internality and substance. Yes. Mm -hmm, exactly. But I mean, in a way, you're saying that it's got, you know, what, what is another way to say that? Well, another way, way to say it might be is what's, what's, the, what's the ground upon which we stand? You know, where, where is our awareness rooted? I it's mean, kind of ex ex existential, maybe, but uh, not necessarily tied. Well, it I might, don't know what's the substance of it. It might be thought of as existential, but it's the only real thing we've got. Yeah. What, I mean, what, what, what is, where are you going to where are you going to turn your attention when when death comes around? I mean, you, you you're going to keep trying to desperately lock it on to something that's moving out in the world in the last minutes, or is that attention finally going to to put meaning on that which uh, it comes from. Is attention going to turn back in on itself? It has to at some point. It was, I hadn't been to a TAP meeting in quite a while. It was good to get back to one after oh, a year and a half break and to come back and see that things are still working quite well. You know, that, that the work of TAT is ongoing and I can't see still anything that's really quite up to the standards and vibrancy that you know, still comes from these meetings. You, know, it's, you it's see been, the love of your, of your of your fellow man, and, and it, you can see his. You know, he, there he is. Yeah. And these guys I knew before, and then they're, you know, there they are in their in their in their flowered state. They're flowering in a different way, and it's mm -hmm. so gorgeous. Yeah, and it, it's a I, you know, it's something I'm going to remember forever. It's gotten me on the path I'm on and doing the things I'm doing, and it's probably been the most important thing in my life. You know, bar none. Thank you very much, Bob, for sharing. Oh, you're welcome, Richard. It's nice having you here. I really feel welcomed by you guys. Oh, well, thanks a lot. It was nice to be able to maybe find another way to get the message out. Uh, yeah, we'll do a good job. All, all right. right. And thank you, Bob. Bob Ferguson. Thanks for all. Thank you all for coming. All right.